um, hmm. both statistically and biologically, not significant. Where you're seeing the statistical advantage is in the 1%. When Michael Phelps was in the Beijing Olympics, and he had that that swimsuit on that ended up getting banned. It yep. gave him like a 0.1 percent edge. Yep. But because you're talking about the hyper one percent athletes in the pool, it looked like it was this insane advantage. But if I put that damn thing on, I'm going to look like a manatee floating around. It's not going to do <laughs> exactly. anything for me. But no, it, absolutely. Yeah. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host Thomas Aaron's. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons, and today I have a really special guest on. Uh, I, I've basically interviewed almost everybody in the Department of Wildlife Resources for Virginia, Maryland. I traveled to Auburn just to really try to get some really cool sites. This nerdy science stuff. It's kind of my background. I enjoy this. I know my audience is split on it, but I think this information really does need to get out there. And we are finally heading to the great state of Texas with uh, Jake Norman of the Texas Park and Wildlife Department to talk about the thing that everyone is bitching about online, which is forward facing sonar. But finally, we have data and we can have a, a conversation about this. Um, Jake, thank you so much for coming on today. No, absolutely. I appreciate you having me. Um, I love getting opportunities like this to come out and spread our information far and wide and talking to folks like you just to really get people more aware of what we do and what we're finding. So, I mean, as always, when I start with, with, with y'all, like, how did you get involved in, in conservation? Sure. Um, I was one of those kids, truthfully, all the way back in high school. Uh, I knew what I wanted to do then. Like my freshman year in high school, I, you know, your, your guidance counselor, your teachers say, what do you want to be? I, like, I want to be a fish biologist. And most of them kind of looked at me strange, like what I, they didn't even know what it was. Um, I had like, I always joke, I had a small stent. I think my sophomore year was like, nah, I think I want to be a dentist. That, that didn't, that didn't last long. Honestly, I just, from the get go, fishing has been my passion. I was obsessed with it as, as a kid and it just, just seemed like the, the normal route. So I finished up high school, uh, went to the university of Missouri, earned an oh. undergraduate degree there, um, in their natural resource department. And then went on, got a master's degree at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. And as I was finishing up there, truthfully, I started throwing out a shotgun blast of applications around the country. And I honestly, I was I was willing to probably take a position anywhere at first just to get my foot in the door. Uh, truthfully, at the time, the market was really flooded and competitive. So I was willing and able to move anywhere. And honestly, Texas would have been at almost at the top of my list. So. I applied, interviewed, and was offered a job here. I've, I've been here since 2013 now, and it's I'm a lifer in the state. I love the agency. I love the state. I'm, I'm where I need to be. Yeah, and apologies if you already mentioned this, but are you a Texas born and raised, or where are you from originally? Yeah, sure. No, I actually I grew up in the Midwest, so um, Grafton, Illinois, which is a, a small town. I always say right where the Illinois and Mississippi rivers come together. Oh, cool. Um, so right across from St. Louis, I. I I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan. I could get to a game in about 45 minutes more. I grew up, but so a small town in the Midwest, right on, right off the river. That is a bucket list item of mine is to see a cards game in uh, at their home stadium. God, I don't want to do that so bad. Yep. It's, it's still a great experience. They're finally showing some signs of life again, too. They've, <laughs> they've been struggling, but they're um, maybe on the rebound right now. I know. And, and luckily they're cutting their budget down compared to like the Albert Pujols era where they just started to just throw so many resources into him. Um, yeah. But but I digress from from baseball <laughs> talk. Uh, how did this this study come to be? Was this something that was always in the work or was this a reaction to the the cultural zeitgeist or? Sure. To be honest, it um, I'd like to say we were maybe a little bit ahead of the game on this in some capacity, and we didn't really even plan on going into this much detail at first, but I was back, I think 2020, and it was actually one of my new biologists I had just hired. Um, he came up with the initial idea of just asking the basic question. You know, we do creel surveys in Texas all the time. In my district, I have at least probably two lakes that I'm doing a creel survey on year round. So creel surveys, essentially angler interviews. It's either at the boat ramp or out on the water. We ask a series of questions. What were you fishing for? How long did you fish today? Um, how much money did you spend on the trip today? Where are you from? Your zip code, 
And then of course the fish, what they caught, what they released. And it just, it's creel surveys give us a great snapshot of the angler side of our lakes and just came up with this. So why don't we ask the question, did you use forward facing sonar during your trip today? Just a yes or no. Very simple baseline, easy to incorporate into our surveys and easy to incorporate into our data entry. And that yes or no from right there allowed us just to tease out essentially two different angler groups of people using live scope and people not users and non-users. So then from there, you could look at um, their catch rates, their harvest rates, the size of the fish they were catching. Um, were they fishing longer? Were they traveling further? All the, all, all the normal metrics you would get from a creel survey, but now you could split it out for people using um, forward facing sonar or live scope. I'll say live scope a lot, of course, just interchangeably. Um, but, and so from there, it really, we started doing that just on a few lakes in my district at first. And then we're like, well, this would be easy to probably expand. Why don't we see who else around the state is, is conducting creels right now and get, start collecting the same information. So it started to just, you know, build from there. And we started getting a larger data set, more lakes around the state with this same information. And then it really got to a point where it's like, okay, well, we have all this information. And about that time is when I think the general public really started to really spin out of control, as you said, all the, all the bitching and moaning online and everywhere else just, so luckily we started to have this data set built up almost before it really got crazy. And it allowed us to kind of look at it and say, well, we have this basic fishery information, the angler information. Why don't we you know, dive into it a little bit more and maybe see if it's actually going to hurt our populations. Let's do some modeling. Let's look at some population characteristics and see if all of this increased fishing pressure, increased catch rates, harvest potentially, if it's going to actually, if, is it much ado about nothing or is it actually going to impact our populations? And, and then we're about to get into the PowerPoint here for everyone that, that's listening and watching. What was the timeline then about when you really started to start collecting data? So I think the bulk of the data is really 20, 22 and 2023. So most of the, okay. from the analysis and the data that is in the study, and actually there's um, a publication pending that'll be out as well. Um, so all of that was really pooled from 22 and 23. There was some on the front end and a little bit in 2020 and 21, but the bulk of it from what I'm talking about will be 22, 23. Awesome. Awesome. Well then, yeah, let's absolutely get into it here. Let me see if I have to be the one that shares the old screen. There we go. I think that's it. Okay. We good. Yep. I think we're good. Awesome. Oh, sorry if I have emails popping up. Nope, fine. <laughs> so yeah, I'll just go through and give this as I guess, as I would be talking to the general po population, if you're good with that, go yep. through. And then after so, each slide, I'll just ask some questions if that's okay. Yeah. So, and the, so the first part, I'm going to kind of just go through, kind of build up a reason for why this is all important to begin with. So some of this might be very redundant, but I kind of just go through a, a cool timeline. Let me go ahead and jump forward of the evolution of sonar. And if you look back all the way to 1957, we had flashers um, that that was it. And people thought it was the best technology in the world at the time, really gave people improvements in their angling success at the time. You know, go to 1970s, you have paper graphs and it's hard to believe, you know, physical paper, paper graphs people were using and again, increasing their success with this, what now seems crazy dated technology. Uh, 1984, so a year before I was born, actually, I was born in 85, we get digital display screens. First time ever. I actually had one of those on my boat up until a year ago. That was still quite functional and still still provided some benefits. Uh, of course, an, another really big advancement, yeah, I think was, people yeah. probably overlook a lot, but when 100%. we started having GPS built in, uh, 1995. So obviously not the detail and the great contour maps we have nowadays, but still the ability to see where you're at on the lake, start saving positions on the lake to replicate where you're going. I think that's, again, often overlooked at how much of an advancement that was. I 100% agree, whether it's from just a safety standpoint or being able to triangulate. No yeah. one talks about how that revolutionized fishing. No, and it, it again, 1995, it, it seems like that really didn't, expand until recent years, but that's been around for several decades now. And again, not half, not having to look at three different land points and say, I think that brush piles here, that humps here, that drop offs here based off of these three different landmarks, being able just to go find it 
such such an advancement and a big aid in fishing. And then, um, of course, we went a little while before anything crazy came around again, but then tw 2009, the side scan. And again, I think that was, at first, people really didn't understand even what it was, how to use it. It took a while for it to really gain traction and most anglers to really see its benefits. But again, the ability to look out 60, 70, 80, 100 plus feet on each side of the boat, so covering a lot more water, marking initially just structure and brush piles and timber, and now being able to identify individual fish or schools of fish off to the sides of the boat, such an such an advancement, and especially if you look back at the flashers to side scan, really came a long ways. And then, of course, uh, 2018, I guess, is when the devil really came out of the box. And mm. here, here we have, you know, live scope. And that's, of course, what I think has triggered more discussion, more hatred in Passion. some capacity than, than any of these other technologies that also that really had great, great um advantages as well but it, it was really live scope that really seemed to shift the shift the wheel a lot for a lot of people um this is just a, a fun slide just to kind of highlight all of the you know i'm sure you've seen plenty of this as well but some of the favorite quotes I'll, I'll skip through a few of them but i think let's see this one it gives his eyes in the water just about anything you want to know that machine right there will tell you of course that's that's taken a direct quote from someone here in in East Texas, um, fair chase fishing. Uh, I'm concerned about how quickly this increased pressure can degrade trophy potential and general fish populations, mm. so on and so on. I mean, it, it doesn't take very much of a search online and you can find this type of, these quotes and this concerns any day of the week. Now, and probably these any, are some of the most tame mm, conversation points. On <laughs> yes, well, this presentation was for a, a professional meeting <laughs> initially, so yeah, we had to keep it as, as professional, I guess, and tame as we could, but like I said, I, most people now have seen you know, probably all the way down to death threats and other, just the, the craziness that has stemmed from the utilization of live scope. And I think it really put, has put our anglers into two groups. Of course, you're either, you're for it or you're against it. Um, yeah. I don't know that there's too much of a gray area. It's people either say, oh, it's just another tool. It's what's, it helps me. It's, it's it increases my fishing success. Why would I not use it? Or the people that are like, oh, it's it's gone too far. It's cheating. It's you know, it, it's crazy how far we've gotten and how divided we are over this one piece of technology. But it's it's where we're at right now, for sure. Yeah, and I think the other aspect, when you go back to the timeline, um, if you look I, and I already see guys, I also have the slides up here just so I can I can uh, look back. You know, 2008, 2009 is when SideScan comes out. Well, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the social media zeitgeist was in its infancy. It was baby. Yeah. This great point. to me seems like the first time that we had this technology boom with the social media zeitgeist that we're in. Oh, absolutely. And even, I guess, you know, even on, say, the professional level, we didn't have you know, MLF and BASS live streaming all of their events so it you know you had to had to wait a month or whatever it was or you know a week for it to be recorded and watch that little one hour show it wasn't <clears throat> available live constantly so you couldn't see the anglers at the top of the top of their game the professionals implementing utilizing this technology as well and i think that just steamrolls with social media and everything else to really grow the division that we're seeing now <coughs> Cause I think it was 2017, 2018, I believe when they started to really live stream or maybe it was 2019. It was around then. So yeah, absolutely agree yep. with that. Right around that time. So, so of course with that, um, I, I use this slide a lot in a lot of my talks because I, I, I always say any, any work, any studies we like to do it, it, it's not just because I want to go out there and I want to get published or I want to make presentations. It's, it stems from, an issue, an actual problem on our waters. So it, it starts with a lot of cussing and discussing, trying to figure out what we're going to do about it. Do we need to do anything? How do we address it? What will we get from it? All of those questions. So I, I love this as a good transition, but this is really what it took. And of course I mentioned, mentioned earlier that all stemmed from, from our creel surveys. So these, this is kind of just an example of some of the output, some of the basic metrics, some of the values and data we can get from our creel surveys and 
I said my uh, biologist that I hired in 2020, uh, Quentin Dean, was the one that just came up with the, well, why don't we just ask the question, did you use LiveScope during your trip today, yes or no? And <clears throat> it really was. It, it opened up a whole new suite of data to look at all of this information, or you can see it here, all of this information, um, but we could split it out for anglers using live scope and anglers not. So two different groups now, users and non-users, and all those normal metrics we can now look at individually. Um, so here's roughly the lakes that we initially included. It was eight reservoirs. You can see a lot of it's in East Texas. Um, that also has to do with the fact that East Texas is what I call the rainforest of our state. It's where we always have normally have water so we have a lot more water bodies so they're they're packed in a lot tighter um we've got great lakes of course all around the state but that's part of the reason you see them really piled up here in the northeast <clears throat> but like i said we're able to some of the big estimates that we can get at for users and non-users um, overall effort utilization of course and then the biggies catch and harvest so are their catch rates actually different are their harvest rates actually different because right there, of course, there's it's easy to look at face value. You see pictures on social media and people with giant limits of any species are just like, oh, of course, they, they're cheating. They have live scope. You know, they, <laughs> I love the people that call it the front lookers, but they, <laughs> they have, you know, they have this type of technology. And of course, they're, they're catching all of the fish. They're harvesting all of the fish. Well, we have at least now the data to see if they are different or how different they could be. What is, how do you gauge and quantify effort of, uh, I believe that's effort of utilization? Sure. Well, effort, effort or utilization. I, I coined those separate, just how they're utilizing the fishery or what species are targeting. Oh, okay. So it's not like an, that's not a specific metric of. For anglers ability to catch. Correct. So that's gotcha. just effort. Effort obviously is we characterize you know, how many hours an angler spends in a given day. So that's one thing we always include. When did they start their trip? And mm. if, if so, if they're at a boat ramp when we're doing that, the creel, obviously their trip's over. So we know how many hours they were there. If we're on the water, we're asking still, when did they start? And then how many hours will you be out here still? So that gives us a total length of the trip for that day. And then we can extrapolate that throughout all of the creels and then all of the surveys throughout the course of the year to get an overall water body effort. And then you can break it down by species. So how many hours that our anglers spent targeting bass, crappie, catfish, whatever. And then we can look at how many of those hours were people utilizing live scope or were they, or were they not utilizing live scope? So it's a way to break down total effort on the lake, total fishing pressure on the lake. What percentage of it were our anglers using live scope? So it would basically be just for people that are, that are listening catch rate per hour, so to speak. Yep. So that's exactly how, and I'll show you some basic numbers here, but so yeah, that gets in the catch rate then is exactly that. If they caught, let's just say they caught five fish over the, they caught five bass and they fished for five hours. So of course then their, their catch rate would be one fish per hour. So that's kind of a, a standard metric that a lot of biologists, especially management biologists look at to kind of compare overall angler success either on the same water body over years or different water bodies. So we can look at, well, their catch rates say on Sam Rayburn, you'll, you'll see those exact examples in a bit are much higher than say a Lake Fork. So in, in general, they catch more fish on this water body than this water body. Anglers are more successful here or less successful here. And then you can also look at that, not just the water body, but live scope users. They're catching, mm -hmm. let's say three fish per hour versus non-users are catching 0.5 fish per hour, or one fish per hour. So you, it's, it's a direct way to compare angler success using the technology without, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, 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 it does. Okay. Sorry. I'm yeah. just, I'm just, no. yeah. Sometimes I forget that I'm actually supposed to be hosting instead of just listening. <laughs> no, not a problem. And then of course, so harvest is calculated essentially the exact same way. Um, broken down as how long the trip lasted and how many fish they harvested over that time frame. So it'd be fish harvested. Um, you can look at it per hour for the course of the day as well. Was this data collected evenly throughout the, the year or was it more heavy in spring, summer, fall, et cetera? So, sure. So most of these lakes were doing a full year creel survey. Um, okay. 
we have the discretion, you know, we have the decisions to make on all of our lakes. Sometimes we know our, our fisheries are only really booming, say in the spring or some even in the summer. So you may just, may just creel during that time. Most of our big water bodies and most of the ones you see listed here, they get creeled for a full year. Wow. So we see, and you can, so we could even break down the differences in you, live scope use or just effort in general for the summer, quarter, fall, winter, spring, any, anything. That's cool. Fascinating. Yeah. Now it's, I always tell people creel surveys are one of our most, again, maybe understated tools and just such a useful data set. Um, sampling. And the amount of time and work that you guys put in to be able to do that. <laughs> um, so sure. Each, each quarter, as we break it down, each lake, a standard creel has nine interview days total. So that's five weekends and four weekdays over the course of three months. So it's really not, I mean, it is, it's intensive, especially if you're looking at a, a crew of say four to seven people. And especially if you have two lakes during that same time frame, suddenly that's 10 weekends and eight weekdays for those two lakes over that three month period. And then the, the creel survey itself depends on the season, the length of day at the time, and if it's a access or a on the water roving creel. They'll usually range from three and a half to about six hours for the length of that creel survey. So it um in the big picture they do they they can be time consuming or at least time consuming for individual staff, but the data we get out of it is very, very helpful. Especially some of our I love to call them powerhouse or iconic fisheries that just have such heavy utilization. It's a great way to track the actual angler data year over year or several, you know, we don't creel them for, I creel Lake Fork every two years. That's about the most heavily or greatest intensity we see on a lake. Some of them are just creeled every four years. So you, but you're looking at long-term trends with this. So you can see, say from right here, let's jump back one. Like here on Lake Fork, you can see changes from 2015 all the way up to 2021. You can see how the utilization of this lake has changed or, or hasn't changed. Maybe it's been stable that whole time. So it, and if you see at the bottom, they always say a great, you can really, you can look at some of the values of those fisheries themselves. And that's again, an underrated or understated component of, of managing fish to begin with is how much money is being utilized or spent by our anglers to go fish here. Cause that helps us kind of direct future efforts or future management decisions. <clears throat> it's a lot easier to put more effort on a lake when we see their anglers are spending eight to $10 million a year on the lake versus $150 on a lake. It's, it's why we direct our effort to certain places. Are your lakes down there getting pounded 24 seven, or is it because you're a destination place? It's usually just high points of the year and the rest of the year it, it does level off. Um, overall, yes, they get pounded 24 seven. Um, does it spike say Lake Fork? Of course, I would March, March, April, May, and honestly, any more June are very, very busy. I would say probably March and April are the two busiest months. And this, you know, where it's, you just feel like you could walk across the boats on the entire lake. But there's, there's really never a period where there's, you have the lake to yourself by any means, even on the slow period, say August or, or January, when it's 25 degrees out, there's, there's still people out there every single day. Jeez, that's insane. And yeah. still, you guys just keep pumping them out, which is just insane. It's, um, yeah, I mean, Fork is a special place. And I always, it's, it truthfully is, it's, I hate to say a shell of what it was in its heyday, but it's, it's nowhere near the lake that it was, say, in the 90s, early 2000s. And it's still one of the best lakes in the country. I mean, that's, that's how I always say that. And it's, it's nothing what it used to be in it, but it still is. By the metrics and, and all ten, intents and purposes, it's there's no place like it. Is that also? Is it just the? I guess it's a. I'm answering my own question here. I guess it's a combination of the limit, the slot limits that you have, but also the abundance of cover and forage that that lake. I mean, there's so much cover it's, in that place. It's everything, and the the regulation certainly helps. So you got to think, you know, 16 to 24 inches everything must be immediately released. So you're talking essentially a two and a half pound fish to a seven to 10 pound fish is protected from even going into a live well. 
and that that helps tremendously. And when you back that up with the forage base that we have, um, it's it's insane the abundance of shad and and sunfish and um, yellow bass and white bass that honestly on on fork are all forage for for our predators. It's it's impossible. You can put your boat in and turn your graph on pretty much anywhere in the lake, and you're probably just going to see a cloud of shad in the lake. I mean, it's, there's there's there just isn't a shortage of food. Mm. And then you pair that with, say, just the the structural diversity. It really has, you know, of course I say structure is the the points, ridges, ledges, drop offs, just shoreline complexity. It's just a structurally diverse lake, so fish have tons of access to open deeper water when they want to. So say in the summer months, they have easy access to still get out to a more comfortable water temperature where they're not as stressed. And if they want to move up and feed, it's right there. So they're just not having to work very hard to get food. And that's a biggie. Yeah, it's, 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 I think people always want to just pin a silver bullet on anything, whether it's an invasive species or we need to stock or, or a slot limit or no tournaments. And it, it really is a combination of things that are needed. It's all of it. <clears throat> and some of our lakes, Fork being one, it's just a, a perfect storm. The, the watershed was incredibly fertile from the get go. So it had really rich nutrients, which stimulates the entire food chain. I mean, if you think everything from your your phytoplankton, your zooplankton, and everything up, it it's a healthy system from the bottom up, and that's why everything is flourishing there still. Awesome stuff. So, what is the uh, what's the big reveal here on the next slide? Yeah, so let's jump down. So, yeah, we'll start looking at some of our basic data here. So, first, this is just utilization. Um, so this is what percent of our anglers targeting bass, targeting crappie, what percent of them use live scope versus didn't. And if you look at it, you know, our, our big ones and probably where it's utilized the most being bass and crappie, it was kind of split close to 50-50 around our lakes. <clears throat> so we didn't see 80, 70, 80, 90 percent of everyone out there was using live scope. And we also, without a doubt, it's very prevalent still, you know, close to half of our anglers on the water are using live scope. Um, here's the, here's what I think one of the bigger ones is, um, catch rates. And this is just looking at largemouth bass here. But if you look here, catch rates average, and this is for all the lakes combined, 0.82 fish per hour for people utilizing it versus 0.71 for people not utilizing it. Um, hmm. both statistically <clears throat> and biologically not significant. This is so important because I have talked about this on my show before referring back to other sports where where you're seeing the statistical advantage is in the 1%. When Michael Phelps was in the Beijing Olympics and he had that that swimsuit on that ended up getting banned, it yep. gave him like a 0.1% edge. Yep. But because you're talking about the hyper 1% athletes in the pool, it looked like it was this insane advantage. But if I put that damn thing on, I'm going to look like a manatee floating around. It's not going to do <laughs> exactly. anything for me. But no, it, absolutely. Yeah. And this is a good way to kind of look at that. You know, this isn't just professional anglers or just people out there the first time. This is everybody, you know, over the course of a year on water body. So when you average it all out, the difference isn't that large at all. Um, hmm. So I, I highlighted here. You know, it, if you look at it on a few specific lakes, um, again, some of our more iconic fisheries, Lake Fork, again, where it's in general, your catch rates are never off the charts there because it is a a true trophy based fishery. Um, people go there to catch eight, 10 plus pound fish, fish of a lifetime. Um, 0.27 for anglers using live scope versus 0.24 without. Next to nothing. Um, Sam Rayburn, that again, Rayburn produces plenty of trophies, but it's also just a great high high density, a very abundant population. Um, crazy high catch rates for a bass fishery. Look, you know, 1.43 though versus 1.3. So still, I don't think there's anybody that would look at that, anglers or biologists, and say, see, it's, see what we told you, it's different, it's terrible, it's the end of the world. Now, um, it's not in this, this presentation, again, was, was just for the, uh, the Bass Conservation Summit. So it's pretty much all focused on black bass, largemouth really on this one. Now I will say, you know, we have all this data for crappie as well and have really gone into more in-depth detail. And there is more differences um, yeah. in, in our crappie populations. But uh, 
<laughs> long story short of that, it's still not a biological concern. I'll tell mm -hmm. you, we, we went through it. It highlighted there is without a doubt, catch rates are almost doubled. Harvest rates are almost doubled for folks using live scope. But when you actually look at it and model populations long term, it pretty much showed that anglers would have to harvest upwards of 80 percent of all legal crappie before it started impacting the population. How much of the data also will this need to be done again in 10 years when and to see if there is a skew of, OK, now 80 percent of anglers are using yes. uh, live scope versus. OK, yeah, no, I, absolutely. I mean, this is one of this was kind of, you know, a good baseline early yeah. introduction, the first inception where it really exploded. I mean, I, without a doubt, it's going to become <clears throat> probably the norm at some point um, where every boat has it. And most likely more people will be more efficient at it. I mean, that's that's, I think, fair to say the longer it's available. I think more people like you see it in our in our youth, our younger people, the anglers right now, they they eat this technology up. And I think there's more and more younger anglers getting into the sport where all they know is is live scope and I, you got to think generationally how do, how does that impact everything down the road that great question and definitely one of the reasons this isn't something you just look at once and say see now it's no concern no worries but <clears throat> this is kind of paves the way for a way to continue to monitor it relatively easily that's insane i mean it really does show you the the hyperbolic nature, I think, of social media nowadays yeah. and and how it can blow things out of proportion, which I think everyone can agree that social media has definitely done that with this topic. Absolutely. Um, and I'm really glad that somebody actually put data out there to show over a long period of time, like so far, this is what we have and this is what is actually being shown. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, let's slide an even bigger, <coughs> I think issue to look at is, is harvest. Bass in general, um, you know, I mentioned here, especially our anglers, most of our water bodies release 90% plus of our legal fish to begin with. So you know, if you look at our harvest rates, 0.1 for anglers using live scope, 0.09 for not, again, if they're not harvesting fish, I think the big question is, does it really matter if they're using the technology or not for that species? If they <clears throat> harvest is ultimately probably the biggest way to say crash a fishery. If if they're not harvesting bass, does it matter how they're you know if they're still catching them with a rod and reel? Does it matter? Mm. <clears throat> and I would say in most situations it doesn't. So that's another biggie I think that I always want to drive home. Again, we we looked at this for every species as well, and I think where there's just as much growing concern right now is in the crappie fisheries and crappie populations around the country because people see everyone using live scope catching what they perceive as all of the crappie in the lake mm -hmm. and they're, they're out there catching limits daily. And yeah, we, we have again, the data to show that their, their catch rates are higher in most situations, believe it or not. in in some even very per predominant lake, Sam Rayburn, um, <clears throat> catch rates and harvest rates of crappie were, were lower for anglers using live scope than traditional anglers. So it's not even the, say, silver bullet in just every situation where they just come in and ransack a population. <clears throat> but ultimately, with the modeling we've done in, in our climate here, our latitudes, our, our crappie populations grow so fast and die so young that harvest is essentially True. not a concern. Our, our average lifespan of a crappie around here is three to five years. So they're, whether an angler catches that fish and harvests it or not, it's av tip typical lifespan. It's out of our system in three to five years either way. And I could definitely see with something like a white sturgeon, maybe if, if it's walleye up north in a specific lake, I, I, I think there's Slow a conversation. Slow growing, long-lived. Yeah. yeah. You could have a conversation potentially, but yeah, in this situation, clearly, especially when you're talking about the biomass of some of these lakes that are a hundred thousand mm -hmm. acres, there's no way in hell that you're going to be able to put a dent in that. No, it, I've made the argument even, um, again, on the, on the crappie front that if you try to regulate them more, you may end up doing the exact opposite of you want, because when they're living that short growth rates are almost the most critical component to maximizing 
especially the abundance of more quality fish. So if you're protecting them more, putting more fish, keeping them in that system, you might in, in fact slow down their growth rates to the point that they're not, they're not getting as large to begin with. I always say a, a crappie at five years old is a lot more impressive if, if it's growing fast than if it has moderate or slow growth. And I've, I've heard an interesting argument about that too, where when you look at a lot of the state records, there hasn't been a lot of records broken in recent years. And potentially it's because catch and release became so hyperbolic that you it stunts the ability in a fishery to have that one freak versus Japan where there's like three fish in each lake. Yep. Oh, absolutely. And I, you hear more and more people at least realize now or acknowledge that even on, on the bass front that harvest in a lot of situations is necessary. <laughs> if you have consistent um, reproduction, if you have great spawns every year and you have a lot of fish going into the system, well, there's only, the system can only support so much regardless yeah. of if it's crazy productive, full of, of shad and other prey or not, it can only support so much. So if it's overcrowded, growth rates will slow down. And that gets back to what you manage a population or a fishery for in the begin with. Are you managing it specifically for trophies? In that case, you want a lower density population so their growth rates are as fast as they could be. Or do you want a, a high density population where our catch rates are higher? In that case, you want to protect more fish. You want to have more fish in the system. So just, I always call the law of numbers. If there's more fish there, catch rates will be higher. People will catch more. But all of those things have to be considered and again, looked at almost on a, a lake by lake basis. It's not a, a one-stop shop. This is, this is the cookbook. This is how we manage. Um, you have to really look at each lake, look at the data for each lake, look at the utilization, again, the angler data for each lake to really make decisions. Um, the best, best way to maximize the success, um, the happy anglers on that lake. No, I, dude, I, I 100% agree with everything you're saying right now. Um, yeah. yeah, no, it, it, and I think it's about getting this information out to the public and making it cultural, the cultural norm. Um, I, I, have talked about this agnosium with, with SAV where w the general public just looks at it as a weed that needs to be killed. And it's, a, that's baked in the cake with, with normies and it's culturally, you got to start changing the opinions of people. I mean, Ray Scott did it. Like when he said, like, what if we just didn't put them on a stringer? And, but it yeah. takes time to yep. get that into the zeitgeist. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, vegetation is a perfect example. I know we, we talked about this a little bit before, before we started recording here, just about vegetation and um, water hyacinth on Lake Fork right now is a good example where I'm, I'm kind of making the call right now to not go out and instantly eradicate it in every situation because it's not presenting a problem. And it, even people on, on my own team and within this own agency, I mean, every time they go out there and say, we do a survey, I have to even say, it's like, yeah, you see that plant, you instantly see that plant kind of go kind of cringe or go and get, get upset about it. And you just, you just have this innate feeling like you have to go get rid of it. And um, so I'm, I'm not saying that it's not the case and it's not necessary in a lot of situations, but there has to be a, a mindset change, a cultural change to realize that it's, it's not just, you know, good or bad. There's yeah. Black and white. Yeah. It's there's a big, big scape between all of that. And again, every situation, every lake is different. No, a hundred percent. And you, and I, I still don't, uh, I don't necessarily agree with the whole chemotherapy approach where you just, it must be killed on site to protect the native. But then if you nuke the fishery, you're also killing what you're trying to protect. Like that doesn't, yep work in my brain, but I, I could be completely. No, off. no, um, <laughs> completely agree with you there. Like I said, that could be a soapbox for a whole nother discussion yeah. because um, I get very, very fired up about vegetation in general and how it's managed or not managed. It's, it's one of the more critical parts of what we do truthfully. No, dude, hundred percent. And I would love to, um, when we have some material to go over, we'll definitely have you on again to, to talk about that topic. Um, is, is there any more slides that we definitely need to, to um, cover? It's really just, this was just a wrap up slide and some of this I already kind of, kind of discussed before, but one thing I always like to kind of highlight or I'd say it's something to chew on with this is, you know, these results don't account for what we call angler avidity or how skilled an angler is or their, how often are they fishing? So all of this data is looking at pretty much post live scope, 
you know, post inception of LiveScope. So we see these, you know, slight differences or not differences in catch rates. Um, some species, we do see differences in catch rates. What's to say we can't guarantee that before LiveScope, those same anglers <clears throat> that are using an hour are better anglers before they had access to LiveScope and their catch rates were higher then. You know, that because just because we show now that our users, crappie is a good example, that our users targeting crappie, that their catch rates are higher. There's there's a very good chance that those same anglers before they are given LiveScope were catching more fish in the lake than our non-users now because those are our diehard group of folks they're out there the most so of course they they want the best technology they continually want to push the envelope to maximize their day so again that's just something to kind of chew on with all of this is we really it's tough to say for sure that these differences weren't there in some capacity before live scope um and of course i've i've kind of sprinkled crappie management into this throughout this talk but that's of course you know, there's there's a lot more, I think, concern overall on our crappie populations around the country. And in some places, they are warranted. You mentioned, say, like walleye or sturgeon, you know, crappie up north, they grow much slower and live a lot longer as well. So there could be more implications for increased harvest where it's a lot harder for a population to replenish itself. So not just different species, but regionally across the country, this this isn't again a one-stop shop cookbook for how mm -hmm. how to how to go forward. But in our latitudes, our region, our climate, um, it's it's a very good reflection of what we're seeing and how these fisheries are utilized right now. And um, go to that last point: long-term catch rates. That's the only other component, and kind of what I've been, I guess, preaching at this point going forward is that's another thing we don't know: is are we potentially going to reduce catch rates long term because we are now targeting a group of the population that maybe historically wasn't pressured for a lot of the year. Um, bass specifically, you know, live scope lets people go out into no man's land and open water and target suspended fish that maybe before were rarely pressured. So if we're pressuring more of the population in a lake more, longer throughout the year now, are we educating more fish? Are we making them more wary to boats, sonar noise, everything else, and potentially long-term impacting catch rates. And that's, again, just like a, something to chew on, something to consider, something to look at, that it's, we can manage the population, but can we, how do you manage you know, angler catch rates? How do you manage the aggressive nature of a fish? How would you be able to watch the fish behavior and see how it changes over time. And I, I thought this was interesting watching um, Forrest, who's going, another YouTuber uh, who's trying to go after the Tasmanian tiger, and he talks about how he's setting up trail cams all over, all that stuff. Sure. And you look at this technology, and everyone was talking about the negative. I think there's a positive use for conservation efforts where now you can literally record fish behavior and see how they interact in the wild. Is that ever going to be a thing that it could be implemented for? Well, um, Actually, a whole other study and a whole other talk that I gave with this presentation was a, a telemetry study that we did on um, on Lake Fork and Toledo Bend, where we actually <laughs> implanted radio transmitters in fish and tracked them over the course of a year. And one part of the study was your traditional telemetry work, where you look at fish movement, habitat use, you know, weekly position, every, what you would normally expect to see in a telemetry study. But we also looked at more of the fish behavior how do they respond to boat noise? How do they respond to actually fishing for them? And we use live scope during that uh, portion of the study to actually try and visually look at the fish <clears throat> before we actually moved up on them to see, A, were they in a school or were they by themselves? Were they on the bottom or were they suspended? And then, of course, <clears throat> it really helped in watching these fish when we were tracking them as the boat got up to see, you know, did they, did they flee off? Where did they go? So that was kind of just maybe the tip of the iceberg of how LiveScope could actually help in you know, biology and in conservation. But we kind of did kind of work it in already in that project. And I think it could definitely improve from there. No, a hundred percent. As the technology gets better, especially with screen recording capabilities, just to see, I mean, that's the one thing I enjoy with using it is forgetting to fish and just watching how they actually interact in the water. And yep. 
it's not guessing. It, it, oh, I love it. It's it's like you said. I could do that a lot of times and just spend a whole day out there just just watching. You know, in, in some ways, it's almost like having an aquarium on your screen to actually visually see what these fish are doing. What do you think will happen? And I guess this is terrible to ask a scientist is speculation, but <laughs> will fish actually get? They always get conditioned to pressure. They do. Deer do it with hunting. Mm -hmm. Is this something where you're seeing in? I mean, what are we shit. Hit now, we're not even ten years into forward-facing sonar, really. So, we're really at the beginning of this bad boy. So, will fish start adapting to hearing the clicking or, or the boat pressure or something like that? Um, to be honest, it's it's tough to speculate, but I think it's in some capacity. Yeah, I think they will. Um, getting at our telemetry study there a little bit, we kind of answered that it wasn't specifically live scope sonar pinging, but it was just boat noise in general. So, which included traditional sonar pings that we had running, plus just the boat motor, let's say like a lot of it idling around like somebody would be when they're graphing offshore, all that noise, and to look and see how that impacted our fish. And it was almost 60% of all the fish that we were locating would be alerted or move off um, from our boat noise before we even, say, dropped the trolling motor and started fishing for them. Interesting. So... Um, to some capacity, yes, at least on these heavily pressured systems, you know, Fork and Toledo Bend have crazy angling pressure. And that even got it. We'd have, you'd hear lots of anglers say, well, they hear that noise all day, every day. They're used to it. And to be honest, the, the data we had said otherwise, that still, you know, 60% of our total population are the fish we were tracking. Yeah, they were alerted to the boat noise and the alerted being either say they moved off five to 10 yards that you could clearly see or some of them physically hauled and swam off 50 plus yards and all this before again you even put a trolling motor down to start fishing for them do you think it's a specific noise so example is if a pontoon boat goes overhead do they have the same reaction to that versus you know a bass boat sure that's a question that a great question i i couldn't even speculate on that one um just because we <clears throat> we don't I don't have a good way to to even make up a guess on that one. <laughs> I'll be honest. Because I always pontificated with dock fish, like especially public docks where you see a bass and crappie hanging around and you got mm -hmm. 50 kids hanging off the side of it with their parents fishing. It's like those fish got to be higher conditioned to white noise of, of all that going on versus a fish that's in 50 feet of water on a brush pile that's hard to find. Sure. Well, I, I could tell you, at least on depth on ours, it did not matter. If we were locating a fish, there wasn't a difference between fish we found in five feet of water or less, say, versus 25 feet of water. Um, the overall average and the amount of time the fish moved, it, it did not matter on how deep they were. Fascinating. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. So, and on that same conditioning, that kind of, you know, that's, that's kind of what I was getting at with a lot. You hear the general public all the time say, well, they hear that noise all the time, so they're conditioned to it. Um, but then our our tracking study kind of showed otherwise. I mean, sure, half the, you know, close to half the time they, they stayed put, it didn't bother them, but 60% of the time those fish, they were alerted. When, you know, again, whether that just meant they knew we were there, which probably makes them tougher to catch, or they completely ran off either way, the noise was impacting your fishing success. Do you think that, and that was across all species, correct? Or just bass? This was just bass. This was just during the uh, bass tracking studies. So <clears throat> there's about 40 fish total on each lake over two years. Hmm. Now it's fascinating to actually see uh, wh where it goes from here. Cause a lot of it, I feel like is anecdotal from people saying like, yeah, the clicking spooks them off, but to actually have hard proof, like, no, this is actually factually it, correct. I do see this. Yep, absolutely. Jake, I, I mean, I really, this has been fantastic um, stuff to chew on. And I really hope everyone listening really got some enjoyment out of this. And just let us know in the comment section down below what you think. Is there anything else that we haven't really touched on or anything project wise that you have coming up? Sure. Um, to be honest, nothing immediate. I do think, you know, in general, there's going back to the, the thinking, the thinking uh, slide I put up, there's always we're looking at where do we go next. And I kind of talked about catch rates and how it's impacting our fish long term. I mean, in my perspective, that's where where I want to go next. Um, 
we don't have anything in the pipes this very second. I'm still working on a, on a manuscript from from the telemetry study that I'm finishing up right now, and actually trying just doing some of our our regular routine work we have at our office. So um, <clears throat> nothing that's coming up right away. But like I said, I think that's the kind of the discussion of where we want to consider going next and looking at. And to be honest, I don't know what we do with it. Regardless, I, I don't see even if we saw an impact and this would a study like that would take almost a generation you can't just do one year's worth of data on that one to answer it so it would take a long time and to be honest i don't know what we would do with the results so because i think ultimately i'd i don't see especially our agency um i think i'm i can comfortably say this it's not something we would regulate anytime soon on, on the technology front um so it might yeah, the, it's, oh, go ahead go ahead uh, so well, like, with the nature of technology exponential uh, evolution of it is that something that has been brought up in conversations like will there ever be a moment where we do have to cap it or do you think that's just a wait and see um i think it's overall it's a I hate to say wait and see but to continue to monitor and evaluate um, I think some parts of the country, there's more of a push and or I think some things that are even in the pipe are happening soon where you will see maybe some some more regulation, be it either with just traditional fish regulations. Actually, Mississippi just did and they changed their crappie regulations on kind of their four most prominent crappie lakes, kind of in response to, to live scope utilization and, and some data they had from creel surveys. So... You, there are some places that, you know, there's some discussion of some other, again, other parts of the country that they may limit the technology or find other ways to lim limit it or change regulations in some capacity in response to it. But I, I think some of that gets back to a case by case, lake by lake, region by region. Every, every population, every lake, every region has different kind of driving factors for their fish populations. I think we're maybe kind of blessed here in my neck of the woods for one that our our climate's so um, helpful in our in our fish growing quick, growing fast, growing to large sizes just because of our growing season is so long. And with that it's regulations themselves, fish you know, harvest or bag limits don't always have as big of an impact as again some of your slower growing longer lived species so it really it, it it's going to be a regional or state by state situation on how i think how this is obviously regulated going forward but right now and again we the monitoring and the data we have makes us feel very comfortable that our regulations are more than adequate right now is this information um, available to the public or if people that are listening would like to, to, to learn more, where, where could they do that? Sure. So there's a few different ways. Um, I mentioned publications. Uh, if people really want to geek out and dive into, say, a scientific journal, there will be, <coughs> it's a crappie specific manuscript that's submitted right now. Um, hopefully will be accepted and that'll be in one of the American Fishery Society journals. Um, it was submitted to fisheries. And so that, that whole scientific write-up will be published there and it'll go into crazy detail of the modeling that was done to look at the crappie populations to confidently say here's why we don't see an issue in our area um, of course this presentation i think is starting to be circulated more so that's a place where people can just get more information from those contacting me personally i have no problem with individuals if they want to email me or, or call my work phone and discuss more I'm more than willing to to give that information um, and that's that's some of our greatest ways we our main Texas Parks and Wildlife website you can find our our management reports for every lake in the state or every large lake in the state and so if there's any specific projects or research such as, as this going on in those lakes those are always put into those those reports as well and they're wrote in more of a a simplified term so so the general public can kind of decipher what's going on in those lakes go through them that way jake 
Thank you so much again for coming on. As always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. Please get informed about everything. And if you have any questions, you know, feel feel free to reach out to the show. Ask somebody. Always be willing to, be willing to learn. Like and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.